Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining us today. It is a joy and a, a privilege really to be able to open God's Word and to proclaim it to you this morning. I just want to say um, from my side, and I speak for Sheree as well, uh, we really, really miss being with our church family. We can't wait till the, the time that we can come back and sing with you and, and be under the Word of God together again. Um, but as we are scattered, it is still nevertheless a joy and a privilege, and we do believe that, that God works through this time as well. And so if you have your Bibles, please open to the Gospel of John, John chapter 12 from verse 20. And we're going to read together John 12, 20 to 26. It's John 12, 20 to 26. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks, so these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, So we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Let us pray together. Dear Lord God, we thank you again for this opportunity, Lord. This is our request. We, we wish to see Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray that you would do the work of opening up our eyes and our hearts and our minds. Lord, we pray that you would do this through the power of your word, that we would see the glory of Christ and that our lives would be changed through that sight. We ask in your holy and powerful name. Amen. The paradoxical words of Christ that we read in this passage describing the Christian life um, brought to my memory this week one of my, my favorite stories. And so I went and I reread the accounts of the five young missionaries who lost their lives in, 19, in 1956, um, attempting to make contact with the Huarani tribe in Ecuador. Uh, Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, Pete Fleming, Roger Yoderian, and Ed McCulley. Um, and in particular, Jesus' words made me remember the famous words of Jim Elliot, I'm sure that you have heard them before. He penned them in his journal uh, as a response to criticism at what he was doing at taking his family to a dangerous part of the world and trying to reach them with the gospel. He wrote saying, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Now, I want to be honest about what went on in my heart this week. Um, I read the story intending to share it with you, as I have before many times actually from the pulpit, to share it boldly. But I believe perhaps that when I shared it before, I had a, a more naive understanding of the cost involved in their act. As I reread the account this week, my boldness vanished. It was replaced by a pit in my stomach. And it was the details of the story, some details in particular, that did this for me. These missionaries were my age. They were at a, a, a similar life stage to the one I'm in. Jim Elliott's daughter was exactly the same age as my daughter Alyssa is when he gave his life. Steve Saint, the son of Nate Saint, was a little bit older than Noah, my eldest son. I want to be honest what was going on in my heart. And I read these stories saying to God, God, it is one thing to ask for my life, but it is another to ask what you required of these families, of these children. I thought of Alyssa and the idea of not being able to, to watch her grow up. The idea of her not being able to have her daddy around as she grew up. And it made the price of their act, the cost of what they did, more precious. And yet, 
Their blood, we know, was the seed that opened the door for Elizabeth Elliot and Rachel Saint, the, the sister of Nate, to reach the Huarani eventually with the gospel. And we see the response of Steve Saint, who, who gave a lot of his life to these people and eventually actually moved his family there for a time to live amongst them in the 90s. And, and during this time, he was able to piece together sort of more of what happened, the events of that day. And he wrote about those events. And in, in an article to Christianity Today, he wrote this. He said, as the killers described their recollections, it, it occurred to me how incredibly unlikely it was that the Palm Beach killing took place at all. It was an anomaly that I cannot explain outside of divine intervention. And I thought to myself, rereading these words, God, it, it is certainly a costly sovereignty at times. Could I follow if it meant that? And so today, as I approach this text, I do not want to be trite about the weightiness and the difficulty of Jesus' words in this passage. Last week we looked in verses 12 to 19 of chapter 12 at the triumphal entry of the, the humble coronation of our King Jesus. And in that passage, Jesus is a paradox of divine truth. He is the majestically humble one. Powerful, but laying down his life as the Prince of Peace. And in our passage today, we learn that the Christian life, similarly, following Jesus, is also paradoxical. And there are three truths that Christ shares about the, the Christian life that have asked deep and disturbing questions this week of my heart. Three truths that Jesus shares. To be fruitful, you must die, he says. To keep your life, you must hate it. To be honored, you must serve. So these, these Greeks, these Gentiles come to Jesus through the disciples, through Philip with this question, this, this request. Sir, we would see Jesus. Now this request, I believe, represents the single most important request in the whole of life. If you remember in the first sermon that I preached in February at the church, I shared these words as the, the whole of my hope in preaching that when I preach, you would see Jesus. Derek has uh, since then put a plaque on the pulpit at the church with, with these words for which I'm, I'm grateful for. James Boy said, that is a good word for any preacher, so we wish to see Jesus. I could wish that every preacher and teacher of the word might have these words before him constantly as he prepares his messages and as he speaks them. So we would see Jesus. And we don't actually even know if they did see Jesus. John just doesn't say. I believe we can assume that they did. Christ doesn't turn people away who, who wish to come to him. Yet John doesn't mention that interaction at all. There is something that appears to be that appears to be more important for John. This wasn't the point. What matters for John is Jesus' response, because Jesus' response was not just aimed at them, it was aimed at us as well. And so more important for John is that his readers would hear Jesus' words and see and understand what it what it takes to see Jesus. Because there are things that would stand in the way of that. So the question essentially this text asks of our heart, Jesus is asking, how badly do you really want to see me? What is it worth it to you to see my glory? He says next in verse 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So the Gentiles come and ask to see him and this triggers something in the Gospel of John. Up until now we have seen him say, my time has not yet come, my time has not yet come, my hour has not yet come. And now when the Gentiles approach saying we would see Jesus, it triggers something and it changes his statement. And he says, now has my hour come, the world will see my glory. But how different that glory was to what they expected. And this is right after, remember, the triumphal entry. So if you were there that day, if I was there that day, we would be forgiven for thinking this is, this is it. 
The trumpet blast shall sound. We are riding to battle, to glory. But what Jesus says next is jarring. And it brings thoughts of glory crashing down. Truly, truly, in verse 24, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. My, my glory will be revealed. And immediately he speaks about his death. This is the amazing thing about this text, this passage, and particularly the passage to follow. Not just that Jesus will receive glory after the resurrection, that is true, but that is not the main thrust. For John, the cross is the very means, the manifestation of his glory. So D.A. Carson comments, saying it is not just that the shame of the cross is inevitably followed by the glory of the exaltation, but that the glory is already fully displayed in the shame. And this has two implications for the Christian. It shapes, doesn't it? It shapes what we define as glorious, how we see his death. And we won't unpack this now. This will be for the passage to come. But the second imp implication is what we will focus on today. The main point for this text today is it shapes, the cross shapes the very way that we live our lives. J.C. Ryle said this, This sentence was primarily meant to teach the wandering Greeks the true nature of the Messiah's kingdom. Our Lord would have them know that he came to a cross not to wear a crown. He came not to live a life of honor, ease and magnificence, to, but to die a shameful and dishonored death. Not with a coronation, but with a crucifixion would he set up his kingdom. And his kingdom's glory was to take its rise, not from victories won with the sword, not from accumulated treasure of gold and silver, but from the death of its king. And so Piper says, his death for our salvation becomes his design for our imitation. It is his design for our imitation. And so we are called today to die in order that we may live. And we are called by three paradoxes of the Christian life that are the response to the glory of the cross. Number one, to bear fruit you must die, Jesus says. In verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So through his death, Jesus Christ accomplishes his purpose for coming. Through his death, he brings life to the many. This is the purpose of the seed. It must be destroyed in order, in order to produce life. Jesus' incarnated life, he says, therefore, is the, the seed that is to be planted. No farmer comes with a seed and says, this is my pride and joy. No, he would point to the, the fruit of that seed. There is no competition for the biggest, the tastiest, the most beautiful seed. No, you toss the seed in, into the ground in order to gain the crop. Jesus therefore uses this as an amazing analogy of the comparison between this life and the life to come. The glory of the fruit over that of the seed is the picture of the, the betterness of the life to come and the truth that this life is the seed that is to be tossed aside in order to gain the life to come. Jesus' singular mission is to give his life as the ransom for sinners and so similarly those sinners are called to die. They're called similarly to die. Kevin DeYoung says the way of Christ is the way of life through death. So in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2, uh, the, the author tells us that it is for the joy that is set before him that Jesus endures the cross, despising the shame. And so similarly, we are called to, to live for a greater joy, but it, it is a joy that comes through death, through sacrifice. The uneasiness that I, I felt in my stomach this week was upon reflection of what this sometimes means for the followers of Christ. And so the question in my heart, reading about the deaths of those missionaries was, could I, could I really stand firm if something so great was required of me? And yet, when we look at the life of Elizabeth Elliot, and Steve Saint, we see there not bitterness, but further sacrifice. Uh, we see joy. We see no regret. 
while the world shouts waste, we see Elizabeth Elliot give her life further for the cause of the gospel among those people. What is it that makes someone like Elizabeth Elliot go back? I believe it is this. Before Jim Elliot died, both of them had already died. Both of them had already died, and it was a death that had led to life. So, biblically, we need to understand, we need to unpack this. What does it mean that we are to die? How do we die that we may live? What does it mean to die that we may bear fruit? Number one, the Bible speaks about dying to sin, doesn't it? John Owen asks this question, do you mortify sin? Do you make it your daily work? Be always at it whilst you live. Cease not a day from this work. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. Romans 6, 11 to 13. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. The members of your body to God as instruments for righteousness. So we offer our hands no longer to iniquity, but to good works. We offer our lips no longer to gossip or to slander or to angry outbursts, but to the praise of God and the upbuilding of others. We offer our eyes no longer to lust or to envy, but to their fixing upon Christ in purity. We offer our hearts no longer to idols, but to the satisfying truth of the gospel. We offer our mind not to the pollution of our generation, but to the word of God. And Paul calls all of this worship. Romans 12 verse 1 to 2, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. In light of his mercies, in other words, eyes fixed on the cross, the word of God, saturating your mind, be dead to sin because sin leads to forgetfulness, to compromise, to the callousing of your heart and your mind. And get on boldly and joyfully with the business that the cross leads you into. In the 16th century, the teenage martyr, Lady Jane Grey, had been sentenced to to death. She was beheaded um, at the sentencing of her cousin, Queen Mary, known as Bloody Mary. Before her her execution, she served a, a a term where she awaited that execution in a tower prison and from there she was able to write um, and so she wrote a note that she uh, put in her, her personal New Testament and sent that as a gift to her sister with these words. I have sent you, my dear sister Catherine, a book which although it be not outwardly trimmed with gold, yet inwardly it is worth it is more worth than all the precious minds which the vast earth can boast of. And if you with a good mind read it, and with an earnest desire follow it, no doubt it shall bring you to an immortal and everlasting life. It will teach you to live and learn you to die. My good sister, once more let me again entreat thee to learn to die. Deny the world, defy the devil, and despise the flesh, and delight yourself only in the Lord with whom even in death there is life. See, living a life of fruitfulness for the kingdom in the kingdom begins with this. It begins with an everyday view of your sin. So many in the church are bearing so little fruit and it is partly because they have never really taken up armor, taken up battle against the sin in their lives. And what you often see when this is true, that there is no desire really for, for service or sacrifice to give or to sing or to soak in the word or to share your faith. The desire expressed in these words, so we, we, we would see Jesus is all but choked out by an unwillingness to, to give it up, to take seriously or to do battle against the sin that, if you are honest, you love in your heart. 
One commentator writing, the problem is we are deeply in love with the world and with sin. We play the game of life according to the world's rules. Sometimes we drink from the trough of which the world feeds its swine. We relish things that we know heaven despises. To die to live means that we must die to sin, firstly. And secondly, it means dying to self. Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live in the flesh. Uh, I live, sorry, the (laughs) the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So Jesus calls us in the very next verse, essentially, to die to self. The second paradox we see is this. To keep your life, you must hate it. To keep your life, you must hate it. John 12, 25. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now that requires some explanation, doesn't it? How can loving my life be bad and hating my life be good? Uh, Jesus, by the way, uses two words in this verse for life. So when he speaks about loving life and hating life, he's using um, the word that means, in this context, um, a temporal kind of life, suche. When he speaks about eternal life, it's a different Greek word, the Greek word zoe. And that in John always refers to um, eternal life beginning at salvation. So, so what does it mean, therefore, to love life in a way that, that means that will cause you to lose it for eternity? Essentially, that is a, it's a fundamental rejecting of the sovereignty of God over your life and a, an idolatrous focus on self. A focus on self. I am the, the captain of my soul. It is strategizing only for the the temporal comforts and security of this life. It is having our eyes always set on earthly things. It is the the self-centered living that typifies the value system of our Christ-denying culture. So Sam Storms says this, Everything in our world today is energized and orchestrated around the pursuit of self. Whatever makes yourself feel good is the right thing to do. Whatever affirms your self and brings pleasure to yourself and gives meaning to yourself is the right choice. So what does it mean, therefore, to hate your life in a way that, that will cause you to keep it for eternal life? The answer to that is what it means to die to self. Uh, for starters, hating your life is, does not mean asceticism. It's not the same as asceticism, which is the, the refusal of pleasure living sort of stoically, um, the, the refuse, refusal even to alleviate your pain. To hate life here does not mean that you go out of your way to suffer. It doesn't mean being intentionally miserable. In fact, it's not connected to, to joy in that way at all. It is not as well self-loathing. Self-loathing actually is a, just another kind of obsession with self. Rather, as Kevin DeYoung says, it is learning to replace the endless focus of Self with the endless focus on Christ. Sam Storms again says, It means the end of self as the ruling passion of life. It means the end of self-will and self-seeking and self-assertion that has self rather than Jesus Christ as its good. Dying to self or self-denial is another biblical word for it. It's not therefore so much seeing Christ as just a Another possible focus that you throw into the mix of all the things that you want to or have to give your attention to. It's not just, you know, finding time for Jesus as well in my life. It means rather that in all that you do more and more, he is preeminent in your heart and in your mind and in your passion and in every avenue of life. You love him and you desire his glory in all things, whether it be fun or service, or obedience, or work, or suffering. In everything you do, you display to others that He is the preeminent treasure in your life and in the universe. John Calvin comments on this. He says, hating life, it's not that we ought absolutely to hate life, which is justly reckoned to be one of God's great blessings, but that believers ought cheerfully to lay it down when it impedes them from approaching Christ. 
So there's no problem when passion for Jesus is congruent with the enjoyment of life, with the, the beauty of your child's smile or the, the fresh smell of coffee in the morning. But there is a problem when your passion for other things impedes the walk with Christ that you have been called to travel. When he returned from the mission field, David Livingston gave a lecture to a group of students at Cambridge University in which he said this. He said, for my own part, I have never ceased to rejoice that God has appointed me to such an office. People talk of the sacrifice I have made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Away with the word sacrifice in such a view and with such a thought. It is emphatically no sacrifice. Say rather it is a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering or danger now and then with the foregoing of the common conveniences and charities of this life may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver but the, and the soul to sink. But let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us and for us. I never made a sacrifice. I never made a sacrifice. And these words lead us to the final glorious paradox that we see in this passage. Number three, to be honored, you must serve. To be honored, you must serve. In the final verse, verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Serving me means following, Jesus says. And following means you are where I am. And if you follow and if you are my servant, my Father will give you honor. How do you know that you are a servant of Christ? You follow him. You hang with him. You go where he goes and you do what he says. And where, by the way, is Jesus going when he says these words? My hour has come. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it produces no fruit. Jesus is on his way to the cross. And so following Christ means that we pick up our own crosses. There are many private friends of Jesus who would not be public friends. There are many fair weather friends of Jesus, but few who remain when the cost is great. But those who honor the Son in this life will be honored by the Father. This call from Christ is to make Him, to make Christ your greatest treasure. But notice that the call and the reward go hand in hand. To serve is to follow, and to follow is to be where, where He is. So if you serve Him, you follow and you are where He is. And what more, what more do you or I ever need? It has been said that follow me is the whole of a Christian's duty, as to be where Christ is the whole of His reward. See, what we're saying here is that we simply... We do not aim high enough in this life with our desires. So many of us would, if given the offer of a little earthly success with, without much trouble in the world, that would be enough. That would be enough. But he has so much more, so much more in service to him. So whatever pull this life has for you, whatever you imagine impossible to give up for the sake of Christ. And I know some people, I have friends today who are asked to give up much. Much is being asked of them. And so I do not say this lightly. But I promise with all my heart, whatever it is that you are scared of giving up, whatever it is that you are clinging to, that you are not willing to release, whatever it is that you, you think you cannot live without for the sake of Jesus, I promise you with all my heart, it cannot compare with this, with the honor that is given by the Father. A couple months ago, on our elders retreat, we looked at a similar promise in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4. Promise to elders in the church 
who for faithful service of shepherding the flock that belongs to the chief shepherd will receive the crown of life. They will receive the crown from the chief shepherd. It is unthinkable that we would hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You see, I, I know with, with full joy that I will see him face to face. I will have it as my eternal joy to give him honor and to give him glory and to give him love, the, the lamb who was slain for me. I know I will see him and it will be a joy. But to hear that the father would honor me is unthinkable. It is a glory beyond imagining. And so the actions of five fathers giving their lives in Ecuador, the responses of the family left behind makes sense again to my heart. In closing, I want to read a different journal entry written by Jim Elliott before his death. I walked out to the hill just now. It is exalting, delicious to stand embraced by the shadows of a friendly tree, with the wind tugging at your coattail and the heavens hailing your heart, to gaze and glory and give oneself again to God. What more could a man ask? Oh, the fullness, pleasure, sheer excitement of knowing God on earth. I care not if I never raise my voice again for him. If only I may love him, please him. Perhaps in mercy he shall give me a host of children, converts, that I may lead them through the vast star fields to explore his delicacies, whose finger ends set them to burning. But if not, if only I may see him, touch his garments and smile into his eyes, Ah, then not stars nor children shall matter, only himself. O oh, Jesus, I want to close with this prayer. O oh, Jesus, master and center of all, and, and end of all, he writes, how long before that glory is yours, which has, a, has so long awaited you? Now there is no thought of you among men. Then there shall be thought for nothing else. Now other men are praised. Then none shall care. None shall care for any other's merits. Hasten, hasten, glory of heaven, take your crown, subdue your kingdom, enthrall your creatures. O oh, Jesus, we close with this prayer. Enthrall your creatures. Lord, for some who are listening, the time has come for the difficult work of repentance. And I pray you would cut to the heart in a way that would lead to that repentance and life, a dying to sin. Lord, for others, there, there is this, this call of, of yours upon their life that, that you would be the greatest treasure, but it is costing, Father. It is costing, Jesus. It is a, a heavy call at times, and I pray that you would encourage these, make them bold, Help them to see your glory is greater than that which they are called to give up. Help us all, please, to see your glory, that we may live through death. We ask in your holy name. Amen. Thank you, church family. Have a, a great Sunday after we sing one more song together.